Dear friends, I would like to continue the playlist on macular surgery by addressing the issue of the macular hole and its surgery. And as I did for epiretinal membranes and macular edema, I would like to start with pathophysiological considerations, asking this question. Why do we develop a macular hole? What mechanism induces this disease? So I can hear you from here saying to me, Didier, you are really looking for a fight by denying the evidence. The origins are well known. Everyone agrees to confirm gas theories and to say that the macular hole is caused by tractions, or more precisely, vitreous contractions, on the surface of the retina. But to that, I would reply that, for a theorem to be accurate, no counterexample should be able to invalidate it. In the present case, how can we think that vitreous contractions can initiate a macular hole when there are so many examples where macular holes have occurred in the absence of vitreous cortex or after removal of the posterior haloid. You want any evidence? First, the stage 1 macular hole and its evolution to full thickness macular hole. The first to operate on stage one was Hon Michaels, who was removing the cortex. And despite the removal of the posterior haloid, in 20% of cases, the macular hole progressed to higher stages. De Bustros, six years later, published a study showing that the removal of the hyoid did not change much in the evolution toward full thickness macular holes, thus invalidating the idea that macular hole is due to vitreous tractions. The only thing that seemed to stop the evolution from stage 1 to full thickness stages was the removal of the internal limiting membrane that I presented in 2002 at the SRS in New York. Second, outside stage 1 macular hole. Macular hole can occur after removal of the posterior haloid, either after vitrectomy for retinal detachment or after vitrectomy for tractional diabetic retinopathy. 3. Macular hole can occur after removal of epiretinal membrane and internal limiting membrane. Mariano Iros, in the study he did in 1998 on epiretinal membrane that I had operated on, was able to control 681 cases with an average delay of 45 months post-op and identified four cases of post-op macular holes. So, at a time when dyes did not exist, I can accept even as the inventor of the concept, that I did not perfectly remove the island on the entire posterior pole. But I'm sure having removed all the macular posterior haloid correctly. And finally, for how can we explain the 10% long term recurrence rate that Godric and Massin published? with even four patients who have had a recurrence of a recurrence. You can see that this does not make sense. 
and even if only one example existed, it would invalidate the theory. The macular hole cannot be initiated by vitreous tractions. So, it is quite possible that the whole world may confuse again the cause and the physical consequence of this cause. Remember what I told you at the end of chapter 1 about macular edema for vitreo macular tractions and drones. They are probably due to retinal ischemia, which leads to astrocytic proliferation, which, penetrating into the hyoid fibers, will be the origin of an adhesion between these two structures and during the creation of the PVD of vitromacular traction. The origin is ischemia and the consequence is traction. But let's go back to macular hole. What can it be caused by? Why do we know about the macular hole? First of all, the pathological data. It is known since Madre Perla in 1995 that stage 3 operculum are composed only of astrocytes and Müller cell hand feet, as in membrane. And this is confirmed two years later by Ezra. Now, as you know, astrocytes multiply in the case of ischemia. That is to say, there again, there must be ischemia at the origin of the disease. In no case may this be due to vitreous traction, which, at most, could lead to EGFR stimulation and mullous gliosis, but not astrocytic gliosis. OCT and geography provides us with other interesting information by showing us that there is a decrease in choroidal thickness as a decrease in choroidal flow in the macular hole, contrary to what happened in retinal ischemia, as in venous occlusion, for example, where the choroid tries to compensate for hypoxia and thickens. It's very interesting to imagine that, as in AMD, there is a choroidal ischemia because that would allow us to understand a lot of things. First, the pathogenesis of the two other very specific clinical cases of macular hole outside the so-called senile macular hole. The macular hole of eye myopia which occurs in younger patients, but which is marked by a choroidal thinning, as is also the case in Fuchs hemorrhages. Again, similarity with AMD. And the traumatic macular hole, which occurs after a contusion that may have caused vascular disorders of the posterior pole by damaging the posterior ciliary artery. It will also allow us to understand why we often see an astrocytic proliferation on the surface of the retina in macular hole cases. Proliferation that would be secondary to choroidal ischemia or secondary to an associated retinal ischemia. Interestingly, the authors who studied choroid in OCT and geography divide into two groups. A first group find no reduction in choroidal thickness, while a second group find it statistically significant. In fact, the first group compares the data with the second eye, while the second group find that the decrease in choroidal thickness and in vascular flow are identical in both eyes, but, but are statistically reduced compared to control eyes. This may explain the high rate of bilateralization 
as in AMD. We must therefore rely on these authors whose methodology is much more precise than that used by the first group. And finally, all of them attribute a role to the choroidal perfusion disorder in the pathogenesis of Markler Hall. Thus, if retinal ischemia is at the origin of the epiretinal membranes with all its variants according to the haloid status, including the vitro macular traction syndrome, then the choroidal ischemia would be at the origin of the macular hole and the haloid status would interfere for the clinical form of the hole. But why do these choroidal ischemic disorders that cause macular hole and AMD occur in the macula? So, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is that special macular fragility related to the enormous blood flow requirements for its functioning. I showed at the French Society of Ophthalmology in 1985 using a pulsed microdoppler with a helium neon guide to selectively measure the flow of the short posterior ciliary ret retromacular arteries. That the transition from the darkness to light is accompanied by five to seven times more blood flow in the retromacular choroid. But the choroid, which receives 80 percent of the ocular blood, must be able to adapt to these specific demands. There must be another reason. In the brain, ischemia occurs preferentially at the level of the watershed zones. This is to say, the areas separating two neighboring arterial systems. Could the vascular vulnerability of the macula be explained by the existence of watershed areas? Are there watershed zones in the macula? Before 1979, it was considered that the ciliary arteries, the posterior ciliary arteries, entered pelmixed behind the macula and were distributed at the passage to the macular choriocapillaries and therefore without a watershed zone. But Zoro has arrived. In 1979, at the end of my internship, I discovered during my thesis, I say discovered because nobody had found it before me, that on each side of the optic nerve, the short posterior ciliary arteries were divided into two quite distinct groups, and this is one of the few constants that I was able to individualize in the whole vascular systematization of the choroid. A first group of five to six arteries, which I called paraoptic ciliary arteries, enter along the optic nerve and vascularize a portion of choroid similar to that of the early angiographic delay area, extending to the macula. The second group, the distal ciliary arteries, including the long posterior ciliary artery, enter on the temporal size behind the macula and spread out centrifugally. They are larger and more numerous than the paraoptic arteries, from which they are separated by a kind of silent valley. So I made catheterization of these paraoptic and distal trunks to inject them with different colors. Here the paraoptic trunk in white and the distal trunk in black, 
And you can see that the watershed zone separating these two groups of arteries passes through the macula. This thesis was awarded the Chibre Prize, that is to say the prize of the best French thesis of the year, and everything has been published. This discovery confirms the hypothesis that there is at the macular level a watershed zone and therefore that the macular hole could be due to a choroidal ischemia at the macular level. But are there other watershed zones in the choroidal level? Well, yes, because the choroid is supplied by two different arterial systems the posterior ciliary arteries backward and the anterior ciliary arteries which form with the long ciliary arteries the major arterial circle of the iris. From this arterial circle the recurrent anterior ciliary arteries come back at the equator facing the short posterior ciliary arteries. Sometime there will be anastomosis between these two different systems. This is what you see in this example taken at two different magnifications, where the red arrow indicates a recurrent anterior ciliary artery and the black one a short posterior ciliary artery. At high magnification, you can clearly identify the full canal anastomosis. However, most of the time, this type of anastomosis is not visible, it did not exist, and a watershed zone can then be found at the equator. This is interesting because where do you find retinal holes outside the macula? At the equator, at the level of the lattice degeneration zones. And I'm sure that if we could perform OCT angiographies at the level of the palisades, we could find a choroidal thinning corresponding to the retinal thinning. And strangely, these yellinized white vessels that we can find in the latest uh, degeneration look like something evade my wife identified in scanning electron microscopy on the ILM of the macular hole, published in Joe's report in 1996. She had observed that there are things that she called vessel-like strings. In the year 2013 or 2014, I don't know, I don't remember, I heard in an international congress an operator reporting having individualized on the edges of the macular hole a small white filament resembling a fibrotic vessel. I have not been able to trace the name of that operator. But if one goes further in the reflection, why are tears often made of the back edge of the lattice degeneration? I can give you an explanation. We are at the equator, at the meeting point of two opposing arterial systems. For some reason, the circulation of an artery is blocked. As there is no anastomosis, the choroid no longer feeds the retina, which becomes thinner, thinner and suffers from hypoxia. As a reaction to hypoxia, as we saw in the chapter on edema, an astrocytic proliferation will therefore occur at the inner layer it will enter the ILM and penetrate 
the hydrid fibers. And when the PVD occurs, what do you think will happen? A tear on a thin retina. And if we finish by adding that the peripheral age related degeneration occur at the level of the equator, you can see that all these works well together and confirms the hypothesis that the macula and the equator have a similarity in the condition that affect them related to corridal ischemia at the watershed zone level. There are even publications showing association between the macular hole and peripheral lesions such as latis, retinal holes and retinal tears. So you can see, my dear friends, that there are many arguments in favor of a corridal ischemia causing a macular hole. This ischemia may be related to a vascular disorder as a result of contusion, a corridal impoverishment in the context of high myopia, or an age-related circulatory problem at the level of macular watershed zone. Secondary tractions pulling on the edge of the fovea as well as on the neck of a pullover may be due to reactive astrocytic gliosis or thrombosed vessel or other unknown mechanisms resulting from this ischemia. As you can see, we have, you have a lot to discover. In the next chapter, we will talk about surgical treatment.